Doing Our Best at All Times by William George Jordan. Life is a wondrously complex problem for the individual until someday, in a moment of illumination, he awakens to the great realization that he can make it simple. Never quite simple, but always simpler. There are a thousand mysteries of right and wrong that have baffled the wise men of the ages. There are depths in the great fundamental questions of the human race that no plummet of philosophy has ever sounded. There are wild cries of honest hunger for truth that seek to pierce the silence beyond the grave, but to them ever echo back, only a repetition of their unanswered cries. To us all comes, at times, the great note of questioning despair that darkens our horizon and paralyzes our effort. If there really be a God, if eternal justice really rule the world, we say, why should life be as it is? Why do some men starve while others feast? Why does virtue often languish in the shadow while vice triumphs in the sunshine? Why does failure so often dog the footsteps of honest effort while the success that comes from trickery and dishonor is greeted with the world's applause? How is it that the loving father of one family is taken by death while the worthless encumbrance of another is spared? Why is there so much unnecessary pain sorrowing and suffering in the world. Why indeed should there be any? Neither philosophy nor religion can give any final satisfactory answer that is capable of logical demonstration, of absolute proof. There is ever, even after the best explanations, a residuum of the unexplained. We must then fall back in the eternal arms of faith and be wise enough to say, I will not be disconcerted by these problems of life. I will not permit them to plunge me into doubt and to cloud my life with vagueness and uncertainty. Man arrogates much to himself when he demands from the infinite the full solution of all his mysteries. I will found my life on the impregnable rock of a simple fundamental truth. This glorious creation with its millions of wondrous phenomena pulsing ever in harmony with eternal law must have a creator. That creator must be omniscient and omnipotent, but that creator himself cannot, in justice, demand of any creature more than the best that that individual can give. I will do each day, in every moment, the best I can by the light I have. I will ever seek more light, more perfect illumination of truth, and ever live as best I can in harmony with the truth as I see it. If failure come, I will meet it bravely. If my pathway then lie in the shadow of trial, sorrow, and suffering, I shall have the restful peace and the calm strength of one who has done his best who can look back upon the past with no pang of regret, and who has heroic courage in facing the results, whatever they be, knowing that he could not make them different. Upon this life plan, this foundation, man may erect any superstructure of religion or philosophy that he conscientiously can erect. He should add to his equipment for living every shred of strength and inspiration, moral, mental, or spiritual, that is in his power to secure. This simple working faith is opposed to no creed is a substitute for none. It is but a primary belief, a citadel, a refuge where the individual can retire for strength when the battle of life grows hard. A mere theory of life that remains but a theory is about as useful to a man as a gilt-edged menu is to a starving sailor on a raft in mid-ocean. It is irritating but not stimulating. No rule for higher living will help a man in the slightest until he reach out and appropriate it for himself until he make it practical in his daily life, until that seed of theory in his mind blossom into a thousand flowers of thought and word and act. If a man honestly seeks to live his best at all times, that determination is visible in every moment of his living. No trifle in his life can be too insignificant to reflect his principle of living. The sun illuminates and beautifies a fallen leaf by the roadside as impartially as a towering mountain peak in the Alps. Every drop of water in the ocean is an epitome of the chemistry of the whole ocean. Every drop is subject to precisely the same laws as dominate the united infinity of billions of drops that make that miracle of nature, men call the sea. No matter how humble the calling of the individual, how uninteresting and dull the round of his duties, he should do his best. He should dignify what he is doing by the mind he puts into it. He should vitalize what little he has of power or energy or ability or opportunity in order to prepare himself to be equal to higher privileges when they come. This will never lead man to that weak content that is satisfied with whatever falls to his lot. 
it will rather fill his mind with that divine discontent that cheerfully accepts the best, merely as a temporary substitute for something better. The man who is seeking ever to do his best is the man who is keen, active, wide awake, and aggressive. He is ever watchful of himself in trifles. His standard is not, what will the world say, but is it worthy of me? Edwin Booth, one of the greatest actors on the American stage, would never permit himself to assume an ungraceful attitude, even in his hours of privacy. In this simple thing, he ever lived his best. On the stage, every move was one of unconscious grace. Those of his company who were conscious of their motions were the awkward ones, who were seeking in public to undo or to conceal the carelessness of the gestures and motions of their private life. The man who is slipshod and thoughtless in his daily speech, whose vocabulary is a collection of anemic commonplaces, whose repetitions of phrases and extravagance of interjections act but as feeble disguises to his lack of ideas, will never be brilliant on an occasion when he longs to outshine the stars. Living at one's best is constant preparation for instant use. It can never make one over-precise, self-conscious, affected, or priggish. Education, in its highest sense, is conscious training of mind or body to act unconsciously. It is conscious formation of mental habits, not mere acquisition of information. One of the many ways in which the individual unwisely eclipses himself is in his worship of the fetish of luck. He feels that all others are lucky and that whatever he attempts fails. He does not realize the untiring energy, the unremitting concentration, the heroic courage, the sublime patience that is the secret of some men's success. Their luck was that they had prepared themselves to be equal to their opportunity when it came and were awake to recognize it and receive it. His own opportunity came and departed unnoted. It would not waken him from his dreams of some untold wealth that would fall into his lap. So he grows discouraged and envies those whom he should emulate, and he bandages his arm and chloroforms his energies and performs his duties in a perfunctory way, or he passes through life, just ever sampling lines of activity. The honest, faithful struggler should always realize that failure is but an episode in a true man's life never the whole story. It is never easy to meet, and no philosophy can make it so, but the steadfast courage to master conditions instead of complaining of them will help him on his way. It will ever enable him to get the best out of what he has. He never knows the long series of vanquished failures that give solidity to someone else's success. He does not realize the price that some rich man, the innocent football of political malcontents and demagogues, has heroically paid for wealth and position. The man who has a pessimist doubt of all things, who demands a certified guarantee of his future, whoever fears his work will not be recognized or appreciated, or that after all, it is really not worthwhile, will never live his best. He is dulling his capacity for real progress by his hypnotic course of excuses for inactivity, instead of a strong tonic of reasons for action. One of the most weakening elements in the individual makeup is the surrender to the oncoming of years. Man's self-confidence dims and dies in the fear of age. This new thought, he says of some suggestion tending to higher development, is good. It is what we need. I am glad to have it for my children. I would have been happy to have had some such help when I was at school, but it is too late for me. I'm a man advanced in years. This is but blind closing of life to wondrous possibilities. The knell of lost opportunity is never told in this life. It is never too late to recognize truth and to live by it. It requires only greater effort, closer attention, deeper consecration, but the impossible does not exist for the man who is self-confident and is willing to pay the price in time and struggle for his success or development. Later in life, the assessments are heavier in progress, as in life insurance. But that matters not to that mighty self-confidence that will not grow old while knowledge can keep it young. Socrates when his hair whitened with the snow of age, learned to play on instruments of music. Cato, at fourscore, began his study of Greek, and the same age saw Plutarch beginning, with the enthusiasm of a boy, his first lessons in Latin. The character of man, Theophrastus's greatest work, was begun on his 90th birthday. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales was the work of the poet's declining years. Ronsard, the father of French poetry, whose sonnets even translation cannot destroy, did not develop his poetic faculty until nearly 50. 
Benjamin Franklin, at this age, had just taken his really first steps of importance in philosophic pursuits. Arnold, the theologian and sage, translated Josephus in his 80th year. Winckelmann, one of the most famous writers on classic antiquities, was the son of a shoemaker and lived in obscurity and ignorance until the prime of life. Hobbes, the English philosopher, published his version of the Odyssey in his 87th year and his Iliad one year later. Chevrel, the great French scientist whose untiring labors in the realm of color have so enriched the world, was busy, keen, and active when death called him at the age of 103. These men did not fear age. These few names from the great muster roll of the famous ones who defied the years should be voices of hope and heartening to every individual whose courage and confidence is weak. The path of truth, higher living, truer development in every phase of life is never shut from the individual until he closes it himself. Let man feel this, believe it, and make this faith a real and living factor in his life, and there are no limits to his progress. He has but to live his best at all times, and rest calm and untroubled no matter what results come to his efforts. The constant looking backward to what might have been instead of forward to what may be is a great weakener of self-confidence. This worry for the old past, this wasted energy, for that which no power in the world can restore, ever lessens the individual's faith in himself, weakens his efforts to develop himself for the future to the perfection of his possibilities. Nature, in her beautiful love and tenderness, says to man, weakened and worn and weary with the struggle, do in the best way you can the trifle that is under your hand at this moment. Do it in the best spirit of preparation for the future your thought suggests. Bring all the light of knowledge from all the past to aid you. Do this and you have done your best. The past is forever closed to you. It is closed forever to you. No worry, no struggle, no suffering, no agony of despair can alter it. It is as much beyond your power as if it were a million years of eternity behind you. Turn all that past, with its sad hours, weakness and sin, its wasted opportunities as light, in confidence and hope upon the future. Turn it all in fuller truth and light so as to make each trifle of this present a new past. It will be joy to look back to, each trifle a grander, nobler, and more perfect preparation for the future. The present and the future you can make from it is yours. The past has gone back, with all its messages, all its history, all its records to the God who loaned you the golden moments to use in obedience to his law. Thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, and get notified.